Thank you. We, re we resume this afternoon with portfolio questions, and we'll start with question number one from Ruth McGuire. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports teaching and studying of science in schools. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. This Government is continuing to invest in science teaching and learning in line with the broader series of ambitions and aspirations set out in our draft STEM strategy. Specific actions supporting science education, including funding the Scottish Schools Education Research Centre for their work in delivering professional learning programmes for teachers in both secondary and primary schools, looking in particular to develop the confidence of primary teachers to teach science topics. We are also supporting the Raising Aspirations in Science Education programme that places leaders of primary science in 10 local authorities to further boost the teaching of science in schools. Ruth McGuire. Thank the Minister for that answer. Next week I'm attending a Girls with Grit event at Ayrshire College, an initiative to support women and girls studying or working in the STEM sector. Could the Minister elaborate on what the Scottish Government is doing to address the underrepresentation of women and girls in STEM subjects and careers? Minister. Well, can I add my support to the event um, that the member is going to? It's uh, fantastic to see events such as this happening across the country to inspire women and girls into STEM careers through positive role models and the information about the jobs and careers that are out there. Uh, the Scottish Government will continue to encourage that work through the developing the young workforce, through our work in the Scottish Funding Council and SDS. And we are also tackling gender stereotyping in STEM within schools through our Improving the Gender Balance project. Again, looking at innovative ways to raise awareness of gender bias with parents, families and teachers. Dean Lockhart. Thank you. Can I ask the Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to encourage people into STEM teaching, given that more than one in four maths teacher training places are unfilled? Minister. Well, as the Member will no doubt be aware, the Cabinet Secretary has launched a series of initiatives for new routes into teaching. Um, the um, marketing um, project which took place inspiring um, new teachers was also specifically um, built around STEM subjects in particular. So this is something that the government is uh, very aware of the challenge to recruit uh, teachers into STEM. It's taking action to do so and will continue to look at new initiatives to take that forward. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In figures released towards the end of last year, it was revealed that uh, uh, lab technicians have been cut by a quarter since 2007, lab assistants have been cut by almost half by 2007, leading to some to say that the, the practical science is no longer feasible uh, in a safe way. What's the Minister's reaction to that and how does that support the teaching of science? Minister. Those are decisions that are obviously taken by every local authority in turn and it is for local authorities uh, to answer for the decisions that they take at a local level. Uh, what I would recognise is the importance um, of um, lab technicians um, and the support within schools. Uh, that's exactly why the funding around CERC um, also um, involves um, lab technicians and the support staff around that. Question number two, Jenny Gilruth. Presiding officer, I remind members I'm the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary uh, to ask the Scottish Government how many secondary school principal teachers and faculty heads there are. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, in September 2016 there were 5,328 principal teachers in publicly funded secondary schools in Scotland. This is contained in the teacher census publication which is available online. Data on faculty heads is not collected by the Scottish Government. Jenny Gilruth. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Deputy First Minister agree with me that certain local authorities have used CFE as a rationale to justify a reduction in middle management teacher numbers, for example, through the creation of faculty heads as opposed to principal teachers? And as the Scottish Government will publish its next steps document on the governance of schools tomorrow, will the Deputy First Minister give serious consideration to head teachers and schools being free to decide their own management structures, including how many principal teachers they have and whether they wish to continue with the drift towards faculty heads? Cabinet Secretary. So, it's important that we have uh, very clear and, uh, and attractive routes into pro uh, for progression in the teaching profession. And this issue around the number of principal teachers and the opportunities for progression was discussed recently at the Education Committee, in which I expressed my view that uh, it was important that there should be these attractive routes in place. I will, of course, reflect on the points that have been raised today uh, as we consider the conclusions of the governance 
review on which I'll make a statement to Parliament tomorrow and set out the proposals the Government is going to bring forward. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, just in light of your answer to Jenny Gilruthen, in light of the evidence that we have taken at committee, uh, would it be appropriate for a decision to be made about whose prime responsibility, whether it's principal uh, teachers in departments or faculties, or the principal teacher of the school, to decide on teacher training placements? Because that's a very big issue for schools. Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure what particular distinction Liz Smith uh, invites me to make on that point. And if she, if she wishes to give me some specific further information on that point. I will, of course, reflect on it. But I do think, having had a discussion just this morning with the teachers panel that I recruited to uh, consider issues in relation to initial teacher education, the importance of the joint participation of colleges of education and schools in the delivery of effective initial teacher education and opportunities for um, aspiring teachers to enhance their teaching capability is at the heart of the arrangements we have to, to, to put in place. So, I see that as a joint responsibility of schools and colleges of education. We have to make sure that it operates effectively to deliver a strong learning experience for the development of new teachers in Scotland. Question number three, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what role it considers the arms industry should have in education. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, schools are encouraged to develop external partnerships with a range of employers to help them develop young people's skills for the workplace and to make learning stimulating and relevant. It is for teachers and local authorities to determine which external partnerships to build in terms of rel re relevance and appropriateness. It is also for them to determine how to involve these partnerships in learning and teaching and how to use them to support young people to gain work and life skills, capability and confidence. Ross Greer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. He will be aware, because I have already written to him, of a teaching resource available to teachers in Scotland where they encourage pupils in a Dragon's Den style scenario to role play being arms dealers. It encourages children to develop their numeracy skills by calculating the rounds per minute of a machine gun. They can improve their literacy skills by learning uh, words like flamethrower and bayonet. The advantages are recalling the benefit of weapons. They're asked to come up with a battle plan and talk about what problem their weapon solves, and they're to create a judgment on what weapon would have been the most effective. Given that the use of weapons is to end human life, does the Cabinet Secretary believe that it's appropriate to ask 12-year-olds to role-play arms dealers? Cabinet Secretary. Um, Presiding Officer, I think it's important that teachers exercise professional judgment on the appropriateness of materials that are used in the classroom. Um, that is the uh, that is the, the point that we rely upon teachers to consider. Um, obviously, the, there is um, very strong judgments have got to be made about the issues that uh, Mr Greer raises, but they are fundamentally for individual teachers to determine whether there is an appropriateness in the material that is being considered and has been used to illustrate the curriculum in, its, in, its, in, in every respect. Question number four, Dean Lockhart. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure that pupils from deprived backgrounds gain more National 5 qualifications. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, we are undertaking a range of activity to raise standards for all and to close the attainment gap. One of the measures of success for this will be young people from deprived communities gaining more national qualifications. Our investment of £750 million during this Parliament through the Attainment Scotland Fund will provide targeted support for children and young people at primary and secondary schools in the most deprived areas in a range of local authorities. This includes £120 million pupil equity funding in 2017-18 allocated directly to schools. Uh, through developing the young workforce, more young people are able to access a wider range of qualifications which better reflect their different needs and career aspirations. This has resulted in an increase in the number of school leavers attaining vocational qualifications at SCQF5 or above. Dean Lockhart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. He will be aware that the average percentage of secondary school uh, pupils from deprived backgrounds achieving five or more awards at level five or higher is 39%. In Fife and Clackmannanshire, the average percentage has consistently been below this uh, Scottish average for five years. Figures show that in Fife, the figure is just 37%, and in Clackmannanshire, it is further down at 34%. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore explain why we see an attainment gap in Scotland which is not only based on deprivation but is now also based on postcode? Cabinet Secretary. I, I would imagine, um, if Mr Lockhart looked at the detail, that there is a relationship between 
uh, postcode and the existence of deprivation, unless I'm missing something in his question. Um, at SEQF level five or better, 53.3% um, of young people achieved um, a, a one or more awards in 2007-8 when this government came to office. In 2014-15, that figure was not 53.3%, it was 74%, a significant increase in the level of qualifications able to be achieved by young people from the most deprived backgrounds. Uh, that's young people from the 20% most deprived areas in Scotland. So that is evidence of rising attainment uh, amongst young people from deprived backgrounds. The interventions the government is making is designed to improve that performance further and to make sure that young people, regardless of their background, are able to fulfil their potential. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wonder what reassurances the Cabinet Secretary can give to parents who can't afford private tuition for their children out with the school day and they will not be unfairly dis disadvantaged by the changes he has made to National 5 qualifications and these changes will not exacerbate the attainment gap. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I would give this reassurance that the course content for um, National 5 has not changed as a consequence of any changes that I have made. The assessment arrangements have changed, yes, but not the course content. So the circumstances that uh, Monica Lennon suggests uh, might prevail, uh, I don't think will prevail. And I come back to the point that I make, uh, I made in my answer to Dean Lockhart, that the increase in the number of young people achieving one or more awards by SCQF level, uh, level five or better, has increased significantly under this government's term in office, and I'm determined to increase that further. Question number five, Neil Findlay. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what funding will be made available to local authorities to increase the availability of childcare. Minister Mark McDonald. The uh, Scottish Government has provided local authorities with £650 million since 2014 to fund the expansion to 600 hours. Uh, we are committed to fully funding the almost doubling of this entitlement to 1140 hours per year by 2020. Uh, we provided additional funding to local authorities in 2017-18 to support the first phase of capacity building required for the expansion to 1140 hours. Uh, this includes £21 million of additional revenue to invest in the first phase of workforce expansion, both increasing the size of the workforce and equipping existing staff with new skills, and £30 million of additional capital funding to allow local authorities to invest in infrastructure development elements which will expand capacity. Neil Findlay. Uh, in the government's plan to expand childcare, can the minister set out clearly what will be the role of registered childminders and what percentage of the budget uh, it expects to be spent on childcare with registered childminders? Minister. Uh, I've been very keen uh, throughout this process to ensure that registered childminders have a role to play in terms of the expansion. Uh, we're currently uh, in discussion with local authorities regarding what their plans are going to be in terms of the expansion, and we expect them to report back to us uh, in September in relation to their plans. Uh, but I've made very clear, both in terms of the statement that I gave to Parliament and also the direction we're taking in terms of the funding following the child model, that registered childminders should be viewed as being an integral part of this. I couldn't give the member specific percentages at this stage because that will be dependent upon local capacity and also what the plans from local authorities come back to us with. But I am in regular discussion with the Scottish Childminders Association and with the local authorities uh, in relation to that specific area of work. James Dornan. Thank you, President Officer. Could, uh, I wonder if the Minister could outline to me how much funding the Scottish Government provided to local authorities for the increase to 600 hours and how much of this was spent in expansion and also what discussions have taken place with Council since the publication of the financial review to address any issues. Minister. Well, as I've said um, previously in the Chamber, the Scottish Government recognises that um, we have fully funded um, the expansion and that was evidenced by the financial return which showed uh, the £650 million of investment since 2014 um, but also demonstrated that not all of that money had made it uh, to being spent on early learning and childcare across Scotland. Our focus now is to ensure um, that we continue discussion and dialogue with local authorities and that's something I've continued to do. Um, we have a, a leaders forum which met for the first time in November 2016. Uh, I've been in regular dialogue with COSLA uh, and I look forward to striking up a relationship with the new education spokesperson for COSLA when they are appointed hopefully later on this month. Jeremy Balfour. 
Thank you, President Officer. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? Will the Minister uh, agree with me that many parents no longer work the standard Monday to Friday 9 to 5, and that often nurseries are closed uh, too early and also aren't open at weekends? And we seek dialogue with COSLA and with other local authorities to see uh, whether nurseries could be expanded to actually meet parents' needs uh, and not be closed at weekends and later into the evening. Minister. I think it's important that we ensure that flexibility is an integral part of the offering. Uh, and that's something I made, made clear in my statement and I've made clear in my discussions with local authorities. But I also believe flexibility works in both directions. And I recently addressed um, a family-friendly working conference uh, in uh, Victoria Quay, uh, where I made the point that uh, as well as seeing flexibility of approach from uh, early learning and childcare providers, we also need to see an approach from employers that is about flexibility and understanding the needs uh, of those employees who have family commitments and seeing how that can be worked in in terms of the employer side of things. So yes, flexibility is a key part of this, but flexibility works in both directions. And Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President, <coughs> President Officer. Uh, given the increase in funding for early years to local authorities, what is the Minister's view on the Labour Tory-run North Lanarkshire Council closing all of its baby rooms? And what impact does he believe that this will have on the most vulnerable babies in North Lanarkshire? Minister. I think it's important that local authorities, um, when they are taking the decisions that they uh, that they must take in terms of their priorities, think very carefully about the impact of decisions that they take. And I recognise the concerns that Fulton McGregor has raised, and uh, I know they have been raised with me uh, by him previously uh, outside of this chamber. Um, and I think that local authorities need to think very carefully about the importance of early interventions, uh, of funding to support early years and funding to support families. And they must take decisions based on those priorities. Question number six, Ian Gray to ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills last met the EIS. Cabinet Secretary. So, so I, last met, I last met with members of the EIS Executive on the 13th of December 2016, and I will have my next six-monthly meeting with them on the 21st of June 2017. I also met with representatives of the EIS alongside other teacher organisations at the Assessment and National Qualifications Group on the 27th of April, and I met EIS FILA representatives on the 14th of May. I participated with EIS representatives in the International Summit on the Teaching Profession in late March. Ian Gray. Well, I think that regular meeting uh, in June is timious because uh, at its AGM last week, EIS rejected the government's Teach First proposal, threatened to withdraw cooperation with the government's new tests and school leak tables, and san sanctioned a ballot on industrial action over pay and workload. And this week, the EIS survey showed that 86% of teachers are telling us their workload has increased in the last year, not decreased, as the Cabinet Secretary has claimed. Does the Cabinet Secretary understand that he has completely lost the confidence of the teaching profession? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it's just another cheerful Ian Gray afternoon, once again. Well, let's... let's well, what I'm, what I'm talking about is the characterisation by Mr. Gray of this. Because let me just go through, let me just go through, let me just go through the different, let me go through, let me go through the litany of misery that Mr. Gray brings to this chamber. The first is on Teach First. The government is uh, introducing new routes into teaching, which must be certificated by the General Teaching Council for Scotland and must have an academic partner involved. There is, no, there is no commitment, there is no commitment from the government to any proposal involving Teach First, but Teach First must be free to bid for any projects, but they must have an academic partner. The second point is about school league tables. This government is not producing school league tables. Thirdly, thirdly, on pay, I answered questions yesterday on pay, one from Mr Gray, which set out the fact that I acknowledge the strain that um, public sector workers have experienced from pay constraint. And the government acknowledges that, and we have set out that we intend to address those issues as we continue our negotiations. And finally, on the issue of workload, um, the government has put in place measures to uh, tackle the bureaucracy that is imposed on schools by local authorities, by simplifying guidance that's available to teachers,
by putting in place the benchmarks, which has simplified the curriculum, which have given clear curricular advice to members of the teaching profession, and the evidence that is coming to the government, and the evidence, and the evidence that is coming from, to the government through the inspection arrangements that are put in place, indicates from the teaching profession that workload is reducing as a consequence of the reforms the government is putting in place. Now, of course, the EIS is free to publish the survey evidence it wishes, but I'm also free to put into Parliament evidence that members of Parliament should take seriously. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I think, uh, given that the Cabinet Secretary doesn't like the tone uh, when we discuss education, it's perhaps because he doesn't like what he's hearing from both the EIS and the teachers themselves. I could remind him that his government has had 10 years to address the issue of teacher workloads. Does he not agree that actually it's the poor delivery of the curriculum for excellence which is increasing teacher workloads? Cabinet Secretary. Well, if Mr Green had been following the reforms that I've put in place, we have set out the guidance which is giving clarity to the teaching profession around the delivery of curriculum for excellence, which has drawn together all of the various other bits of guidance that were requested by the teaching profession to be put in place, which the government and its local authority partners and the professional associations all signed up to over the years. And the measures that we've put in place in the course of the last 12 months are designed to simplify the delivery of curriculum for excellence and to ensure that teachers have available to them the appropriate guidance and resources that can enable them in their task. Question number seven, Joanne Lamond. Thank you very much, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government when a minister last met representatives of teachers and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, ministers regularly meet with representatives of the teacher organisations to discuss matters relating to education in Scotland. Uh, this morning, the Minister for, early year, for Child Care and Early Years met with representatives of the Union Voice. Joanne Lamond. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary is evidently aware of the surveys conducted by the EIS, NES, UWT and others, confirming the evidence presented to the Education Committee that there are significant systemic problems in education, problems which are having a massive impact on teachers and young people alike. And if I can just say to the Cabinet Secretary, it's no good shooting the messenger. You need to listen to the message. In particular, as has been indicated, the Cabinet Secretary is aware of the recent EIS survey highlighting the alarming and deteriorating situation for teachers with a massive impact on the ability to recruit and retain our teachers. And I ask the Cabinet Secretary to be serious in looking at what that survey says in his response. Or will he criticise the EIS for generating negative media coverage? And like the rest of us, talking down teachers and Scottish education. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Joanne Lamont makes a super job of su summing up my opinions of our contribution to the debate. Um, the, the government has taken a number of steps at the request of the professional associations. And let me just go through them for the benefit of Parliament. At the request of the professional associations, a number of steps to reduce teacher workload. We've put in place the clarity around the delivery of cur curriculum for excellence requested by the professional associations. We've removed at the request of the professional associations the unit assessments for National 5 and will do so for hires. We've put in place the clarity that's required around the achievement of levels and benchmarks at every stage requested of me by teachers when I met them in the staff rooms of the country. So these are, uh, we've also gone back to local authorities to reinforce work that local authorities committed that they would do to reduce the administrative workload of teachers. We've gone back to do that and we intend to follow that up. Now, of course, I regularly am involved in dialogue with the teaching profession about all of these issues. But I also think it's important that Parliament recognises the steps that the government has taken to address the issues of teacher workload and we will continue to do so. Billy Coffey. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Could you just clarify, please, the evidence that workload is reducing, as you said just a moment ago there, as a consequence of the measures that you're taking, and how are you measuring that this is having a positive and practical effect? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I set out in my response to Joanne Lamont a number of steps that have been taken by the government to reduce workload at the request of the professional associations. Now, I will, of course, 
continue my dialogue with the professional associations to tackle the issue of teacher workload because I want to ensure the profession has the opportunity to focus on enhancing learning and teaching, which will close the attainment gap and deliver excellence and equity for all in Scottish education. But what we have done is take a number of steps at the request of the professional associations to tackle workload, and I will continue to engage in that dialogue to ensure that is the case in the period ahead. Question 8, Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to tackle Islamophobia in schools. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, there is no place in Scotland for any sort of discrimination, prejudice or bullying in schools or elsewhere, and this includes Islamophobia. This Government is clear that schools should be peaceful and safe environments which have a positive influence on children and young people by promoting inclusion and equality and challenging uh, discrimination. This is why all young people in Scotland experience religious and moral education as part of Curriculum for Excellence, helping them to understand the world's major religions and allowing them to be challenged by different beliefs and values, as well as developing their own capacity for moral judgment. We've also established and funded Respect Me, our national anti-bullying service, and are working with a range of stakeholders, including the Parliament's Equalities and Human Rights Committee, to refresh our national approach to anti-bullying for Scotland's children and young people. Ben McPherson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, comprehensive and, and reassuring answer and, and wonder if the, the Cabinet Secretary has seen the recent report entitled Islamophobia in Edinburgh Schools by Samina Dean, which was released on the 2nd of June at Annandale Street Mosque. And, and does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns about its content? And will he agree to meet with me, Samina Dean, and the Imam of Annandale Street Mosque and potentially other stakeholders, to discuss the report's findings and how to tackle Islamophobia in our schools. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, well, first of all, President Officer, I welcome the material that um, Ben McPherson has drawn to my attention, and I will certainly look at the material that he uh, has raised with me. Um, the government is, um, it finds it completely unacceptable that uh, any individuals would experience Islamophobia, and we have to ensure that we take the steps within our uh, education system to ensure that our approach to uh, the, uh, the, the tackling of bullying in this respect is uh, comprehensive and effective. Um, I'd be very happy to hear further from Mr McPherson on this material and on these questions and uh, look forward to exploring in detail the material that he's drawn to my attention. Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Statistics released last week showed that cases of re religiously aggravated crimes have increased by 14% over the last year. In Edinburgh, funding has been made available by the Scottish Government in collaboration with the Council and Police to eradicate Islamophobia at local level through the Shared Visions project. Are there plans to extend such projects beyond Edinburgh to cities such as Glasgow? Cameron Singer. Uh, obviously, the government will look uh, with great care at the steps that are taken both across my own portfolio and across that of the Justice Secretary to ensure that we, uh, and the Equality Secretary, to ensure that we have in place all of the necessary interventions and programmes uh, to tackle um, the issues of discrimination. And the government reviews on an ongoing basis the projects and proposals that we fund to ensure that we can deliver on our uh, ambitions in this respect. Question number nine, Runa Mackay. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what impact it considers negative media coverage of the education system could have on pupils and teachers. Cabinet Secretary. The Government does not control media coverage. <laughs> I strive to present a balanced assessment of our education system and I encourage others to do likewise. The number of our young people leaving school for a positive destination is at a record high of 93.3%. Success in national qualifications is well documented. In every school I visit, I meet confident, engaged young people who have a huge contribution to make to society. It stands to reason that if these messages do not get across, then the perception of Scottish education will be undermined. Bruno Mackay. Thank you for the answer. In my constituency of Strath Kelvin and Bearsden, we're fortunate to have excellent schools who produce record-breaking exam results. St Ninian's Hanker Kintilloch has just won the Raising Attainment and Numeracy Award. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the opposition parties in this chamber talk down and misrepresent Scotland's education system? It's hard-working pupils and teachers far too much 
and that the extra money being given directly to head teachers will allow all pupils to reach their potential. Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, it was, it, was my, it was my pleasure to attend the Scottish Education Awards last Wednesday, and there were uh, at that event uh, a whole range of tremendous achievements within our education service, uh, which was, uh, I should also point out, if I can get a word in edgeways from the muttering over here in the Labour benches. But the awards ceremony was a joint venture between Education Scotland and the Daily Record, and it was a celebration of the achievements in Scottish education. And it was my pleasure to present to St Ninian's High School in Rona Mackay's constituency the Raising Attainment Award. Um, as an illustration of the achievements that are being made in our schools day and daily. And I encourage members of Parliament to reflect in Parliament the strength and the achievements that they see in the schools in their own constituencies. Because wherever I go in Scottish education, I see plenty of achievement, plenty of it worth celebrating, and it would be nice if some opposition members in the Chamber could come in here and celebrate it just once in interrupting their miserable routine in Parliament. Ian Gray. Presiding officer, this question rather reflects the Cabinet Secretary's clear belief that he should be immune from criticism. Yeah. So can I ask, did the Cabinet Secretary, his ministers, advisers, officials or parliamentary liaison officer have any role whatsoever in inspiring, suggesting, encouraging or drafting that ridiculous question from Ms Mackay? Because if so, they should be embarrassed. None whatsoever. Ah. Question 10 has been withdrawn. Question 11, Maurice Corrie. <coughs> Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that there is adequate funding for local authorities to ensure that all pupils have access to necessary learning equipment. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> authorities spent £4.9 billion on education in 2015-16 a real terms increase of 2% on the previous year. It is the responsibility of each local authority to allocate the total financial resources available to it on the basis of local needs and priorities. All education authorities have a duty under the Education Scotland Act 1980 to provide learning materials to enable children and young people to learn and to succeed at school. Maurice Corrie. I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for that answer. However, a Times Educational Supplement Scotland investigation recently revealed that the charges at Public Private Partnership and Private Finance Initiative Scheme schools on repairing schools in, uh, school infrastructure is diverting money away from the basic classroom resources such as jotters, pens and pencils. And in fact, there are even examples of, pup of teachers being forced to delve into their own pockets to cover the shortfall, in some cases up to the sum of £300 in my region of West Scotland. What action will the Cabinet Secretary take to ensure that schools aren't being shortchanged and forced to resort to these desperate measures? Right. Cabinet Secretary, would other members refrain from having conversations? Cabinet Secretary. That was quite an extraordinary question from Mr Corey. Um, as a representative and supporter of a government since 2010 that has championed austerity and reducing public expenditure, Mr Corrie has the nerve to come to this chamber and complain to me about costs in schools when the party he supports has savaged public expenditure. It is an absurd question for Mr Corrie to have the nerve to ask me in Parliament. And as for, and as for PFI PPP, this lot put lots of schemes in place but the originators of PFI were the Conservative Party. And of course, years later, we are now wrestling with the consequences of the mistakes of the Conservative and the Labour parties. Question 12, Angus Macdonald. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking with Skills Development Scotland to address the reported shortage of HGV drivers. Minister Jamie Hepburn. It's Skills Development Scotland, working with key partners, including the Road Haulage Association, commissioned a review of the labour market issues relating to the shortage of drivers within the Scottish transport network. This review provided a number of recommendations aimed at tackling the current skills supply and demand issues relating to HGV drivers. 
In response to those, a stakeholder group aimed at addressing skill shortages in the area has been established and will meet for the first time this month. In addition, the Road Haulage Association, through the Transition Training Fund, will deliver 250 HGV new job starts to tackle the driver skill shortage. Angus MacDonald. Yeah, I thank the Minister for his reply. Um, he will be aware that haulage contractors in my constituency and throughout Scotland are clearly now paying the apprenticeship levy and are legitimately calling for value for money from the levy. Will the Minister ensure that a fair share of funding from the apprenticeship levy is allocated to address the serious driver shortage in the haulage industry? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I would, uh, I would remind uh, the member, indeed all members in this chamber, that of course the apprenticeship levy was the creation uh, and inspired by the UK government, not introduced uh, by this uh, administration. What we uh, did, unlike the UK government, was we went out and consulted widely on how we should respond. We have uh, committed the entirety of the hypothecated allocation through that levy, through the Scottish Block Grant for uh, skills and employability uh, training. Uh, right now, uh, there uh, is uh, the possibility for those involved in the uh, heavy goods uh, 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 industry uh, to uh, benefit by certain frameworks on, uh, uh, and offered through Skills of Empire Scotland for modern apprenticeships. If they want to meet with you to discuss what more uh, we can do, then I'll be very willing uh, to do so, uh, Presiding Officer, but I would make the point that uh, through the Transition Training Fund, we've already demonstrated our willingness to do what we can to support this industry. Question 13, Marie Todd. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made towards implementing the recommendations of the Commission for Developing Scotland Young, young Workforce. Minister Jamie Hepburn. We are making excellent progress with the Developing the Young Workforce agenda. This includes creating new vocational learning options, enabling young people to learn in a, a range of settings such as college in their senior phase of school, embedding employer engagement in education, offering careers advice an early point in school and introducing new standards for careers guidance and work experience. We have established 18 regional developing young, young workforce employer groups across the country to focus on school industry partnerships, work inspiration, work placement, recruitment and equalities. And we're opening up new apprenticeship opportunities for young people through an inc increase in modern apprenticeships and foundation and graduate level apprenticeships. Marie Todd. Thank you. Does the Minister agree that there's really great work going on in the Highlands and Islands to get our young people into employment, such as the Science Skills Academy, which is part of the City Region deal? And can you outline what the Government is providing to develop young people's skills in rural areas? Minister. Uh, yes, uh, I, I'm... ...work that's taking place in the uh, Highlands uh, uh, area. I indeed was just uh, earlier this week, it was my pleasure to go and address the uh, developing the young workforce uh, regional group in uh, West Highland uh, in uh, Fort William along with the Le Cabre, uh, Chamber of, of Commerce. It was very clear to me that a great range of work is uh, happening there uh, in uh, conjunction with uh, the local college where a lot of uh, remote learning is uh, carried forward as is always uh, helpful in uh, rural settings and of course uh, President Officer this year going forward uh, we will in the provision of our uh, modern apprenticeship support be providing a rural supplement for those training providers who are based in rural communities. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the, the developing the workforce strategy and I could particularly welcome the fact that you've got clear milestones that every year. I think that really helps in, in actually being able to look at where you're going and where you're getting to. However, one of the things I noticed that this year you're looking at the gender imbalance and trying to implement the Scottish Funding Council plan. Because at the moment, there are only one in 10 um, young women who are actually on construction and engineering courses. Now, if you succeed in doing that, can I ask what will happen to those courses like mechanics that are currently oversubscribed in some areas and are filled by young men? Are there going to be, is there going to be more money to enable the gender balance or are young men going to find their places reduced? Minister. Well, this uh, obviously allows me a chance to welcome the member to uh, the chamber. It's the first time I've uh, had the opportunity to uh, interact with her uh, in this uh, format. She can rest assured that uh, this government has a great commitment to all young people who want to take part in, in modern apprenticeships. That's why we are uh, expanding the number of modern apprenticeship starts. We had a target of 26,000 such starts uh, last year, President Officer. We uh, exceeded that, as we have done every year. There was 26,262 uh, such starts. This year we set a target of 27,000. There'll be 30,000 such opportunities by the end of the parliamentary session. So uh, Michelle uh, Ballantyne can rest assured there'll be plenty of opportunities for Scotland's young people regardless of their gender. Neil Findlay. 
Um, just today, I have had information that the Blackburn Local Employment Scheme in uh, West Lothian, which has operated for 30 years, getting young people into work, training and self-employment, is being mothballed because this government did not lift a finger to help that project after 30 years of operation. Is this the commitment this government gives to the young workforce? Yes, sir. Well, we have a serious and strong commitment to Scotland's young uh, workforce, uh, 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 President Officer, just demonstrated by today's labour market statistics, which show youth unemployment is down to 8.8 per cent, amongst the lowest in the EU, down from the last quarter. I'm aware of the particular local situation that uh, Mr Finlay has referred to. I would reiterate the point that has been made to him. Uh, any contract with any training provider is provided on a, uh, the uh, basis of specific uh, delivery uh, in a contractual arrangement with the Skills Development Scotland that's not uh, core funding. He should understand that uh, by now, but if he has continued concerns. He can, co of course, raise that uh, with this government, and I would utterly reject the characterisation that we have not responded to his concerns. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion 6045 in the name of Keith Brown on Scotland's economy opportunities for growth. I would ask members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now.